you as you step up. Um, Claire launched this last week, did a fantastic uh, talk on, um, on fasting and on sort of the general stuff. I know many of us were challenged. I was. Um, Paul's going to pick it up today. Why don't I pray for you? And then, So, Father, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for his many gifts and, his, and, and the many things in his life um, that you've given him and for the things that he's given him to share with us this morning. Holy Spirit, come. Empower and anoint him. Give him words that will encourage us, that will challenge us, and that will increase your presence in this place as we listen to your word and as we consider that and as we move forward in our growth and our discipleship of you. Amen. Good morning. Well, before I kind of speak, firstly, I just wanted to thank you for those who prayed for me. I, I hear we got prayed for um, last week. If you're not aware, uh, I took a team that includes kind of Mark Isles, Tess Evans is upstairs, and a worship leader friend I had, and um, we went and did what's called a, a kind of regional conference where people with the organization I work with who are trying to reach Muslims and kind of gather and... Um, yeah, it's a bit like an oasis um, for them. These are people working in places like Somalia, Mali, Chad, any of these countries. If you look in the news recently, you don't have curfews, kind of government changes, or just chaotic. And, and it's quite a wearying place to be. And so we were real kind of blessing to them. Um, I might just give you one story, but if you're not on the e-press that got mentioned earlier, newsletter, I'm trying to get the right word for it, um, you'll see some more stories. But one of the things the team did was just to kind of go and just ask God to give them words that would encourage and build up those who are there. And I don't know about you, when I receive words like that, it encourages me. It gives me life. It's kind of like God knows about me. And um, Tess, who's upstairs, she'd been listening to God before she went, and she had particular words with different people that she hadn't met, who just come prepared. And uh, she had one word left, and she's kind of like, I don't want to go back without sharing this word with somebody. I don't know who it's for. And um, it was breakfast time, and you kind of sat around breakfast tables. And there's another table there, and um, there was just a South Korean lady there, and she just leaned over and said, I just got this, um, just want to share this with you about uh, kind of just deep roots. And she gave her a picture of an oak and said, you know, uh, I can't remember the exact verses, various verses in the Psalms about just getting your roots kind of deep into God. And the South Korean lady said, how do you know that my Korean name means deep roots? And, um, and so I just really ministered to her and blessed her. If you want to hear more stories, uh, look at the newsletter, get on my mailing list. But thank you so much for praying for us. We really felt that uh, support. Now, renew fasting and feasting. Everybody looks really excited about this, don't you? <laughs> well, you, as you'll find out later, you can blame this series on me. But um, as you know, over the kind of like last year, we've been talking about this kind of theme about renew. And I thought before kind of diving into how fasting and feasting relates to renew, just to kind of think about what is renew. And I just looked up the dictionary definition because that's the easiest thing to do. And, and it says... To begin or take up again, as an acquaintance or conversation, you might like going to renew an acquaintance, somebody you haven't seen for a long time, um, to make effective for an additional period. An example there, renew a lease. Oh, you can't see it, it's only given the white. Um, or to restore or replenish, like you might renew a, a stock of goods. Or to make, say, or do again. What does that got to do with us? Well, I don't know about you, but one of our desires as a church, as a leadership, is to kind of this invitation from God to renew, to do again some of the things that we've seen him done before, that we've read about in the Bible, that we've read about in history, to restore. I don't know about you, but this idea of restoring, plenishing, I need more. I mean, who needs more joy? Who needs more hope? Who needs more faith in this season? trying to look at how much reaction here. But you know, actually, like, well, the, the answer should be yes, that we should want more of it. To make more kind of uh, effective an additional period of time is like, yes, God, we are making this commitment again to you. We often say this in church. When we decide to follow Jesus, that's just an invitation to many more invitations to follow him. When we said, yes, Jesus, we want to be followers of you. We want you to come into our lives to bring change and transformation. That wasn't something that you might have done well, for me, a long time ago now. 
but it's a kind of thing that every day I have that choice to say, yes, God, I renew that commitment to you and the choices and the implications of that obedience. And so that's what we want to do. And so it's kind of links very well into uh, this idea of fasting and feasting. If you were aware of it, my apologies for you and you here, but before this series in September, we're doing a series on Nehemiah. And I promised you there, and I didn't want to disappoint you, because I happened to do Nehemiah chapter 1 and Nehemiah chapter 9. In both those situations, there's a story both individually and corporately. Individually, Nehemiah, corporately, the Israelites that return when they fasted and the changes and the implications it had. And I said then I was going to uh, speak about it because scripturally and historically, renew and fasting in particular are kind of like intertwined. When you begin to see one, you tend to see the other one. And so that's why we wanted to press into it. Now, if you haven't heard Claire's talk, I'm trying to see where Claire is. Claire's right here. Claire's at the back. I'd really encourage you to hear a talk. Originally, I was going to be the first person to kind of kick it off, and then it fell when I was going to be away. And so I wanted to kind of just share some of the kind of reasoning and thinking behind why we're doing this series, why this series is important. It's a subject that I've kind of been talking about quite a while with the, the leadership team. And in some ways, it became a bit of a joke that I was going to bring up fasting again. And so today, I'm just going to share a little bit more heart. You know, maybe look at it. I think the Americans kind of call it like a bar side chat. You know, often when I'm speaking and helping people to grow in speaking, I often talk about this thing called flow. That there's kind of like an order to what you're saying that they build upon each other. And sometimes that's the skill that takes the longest to learn in speaking. Well, this talk isn't really going to have any flow, except the common theme of fasting. I'm just going to share some verses, some conversations I had, some experiences I had. Maybe it's like pieces of a jigsaw, but the common theme this jigsaw is making is why fasting is important and why we should be pressing it into fasting. So my prayer for you and this morning is that you maybe you'll grab hold of something I say through a verse, through some of my experience, and then kind of figure out what does that mean and look like for you. So if you're kind of expecting like A, B, C, D, I'll start that in case I get it wrong. Um, it's not going to be like that. This is just looking at this theme. So I've always been aware of fasting. I've been brought up in church. And, um, and it was this kind of particular verse that was kind of used often. And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do. But they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward that they will get. So Jesus says there, you know, when you fast. And that was kind of something I was brought up as a child, you know, stating the obvious. It says, when you fast. Not if you fast or in your mood to fast. It says, when you fast fast. And, and so I was kind of aware of that as a, a child. In, in, as a child, we kind of had what I would call the kind of holy trinity of disciplines, which meant the emphasis was on reading your Bible, prayer, and then fasting. Uh, and obviously, they are very, very important. We encourage those, and we're trying to grow in those. And also, over the last kind of few years, you've been in this church, we've been talking about other practices. So kind of fasting was there, but it was kind of kind of thing that you kind of didn't really talk about. You kind of maybe did fasting if you were really kind of keen, or there was some kind of major crisis, and it was like, we need to call the church to pray about this, and if you really want to be serious, maybe do some fasting. That was kind of my, I would say, my upbringing uh, as a well, child, most of my uh, teenage years, uh, and church. The other kind of verse that kind of got me thinking about fasting, again, those who know me, one of my passions and loves when I get spare time is sometimes just read a book on what's called um, kind of revival. If you're not familiar with this phrase, revival, revival is kind of periods of time in history where God has just turned up, kind of like maybe supercharged, where things that normally might take a long time to happen suddenly happen really quickly, where suddenly... Hundreds, thousands of people begin to encounter Jesus in kind of supernatural ways that one would not anticipate. You know, you might just do a talk and normally it wouldn't have much impact. And then you do a talk and everybody's crying out, what must I do to be saved? That's kind of what revival is about. And the kind of classic verse that people often come back to in relation to when they talk about this is the, the verse below in 2 Chronicles 7 
verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And so what's the link there? I mean, it's a little less obvious there, but certainly when you read the books and people talk about what are some of the common themes and characteristics that can result in revival, there's things like holiness, there's prayer. But one of them is fasting. And it kind of links into that aspect about kind of humbling yourself. There's nothing like fasting, and I don't know what your experience is. I'll share a little bit of my kind of limited experience in the area. But there's nothing like fasting to kind of like humble you. You might think you're kind of like strong and kind of got it all together. There's nothing like fasting to suddenly bring out like, you know, your weakness, to state the obvious. You just start, if you've ever done it, if you ever, even if you haven't fasted for any period of time, you haven't had food for whatever reason. You know, I joked that last time I flew, um, actually I won't say the airline company, but I said the airline company that I was expecting to have a meal on, did not have a meal. Uh, you know, and I was just beginning to feel weak. I'm like, when I arrive in Egypt, I'm going to grab some food because I needed some food. It's not, it it kind of humbles you. It kind of often, if you don't take care of it, when you're feeling tired and weak, you know, sometimes that's when we maybe lose our temper and we say to, you know, somebody, sorry, I'm just feeling a little bit weak. I'm just, um, you know, I need some food just to kind of keep me going. You know, fasting is, you know, a fast way to grow in humility and humbling yourself because it really makes you aware of your limitations. And apart from this verse, there's lots of verses that talk about that. And so this is kind of like my, my kind of background. It was there. You know, it seemed that as a church, we really did, and less, like we said, there was a crisis. Sometimes we decided to have a, a period of time. And for me, that was mainly, you know, fasting looked like uh, not eating chocolate. I love chocolate. Just telling you, just throwing that out. Christmas is coming up. And um, uh, pretty much any type of chocolate. White chocolate's my least favorite, but any other one apart from that. The other thing I like is um, Coca-Cola. Like, I mean, the, the original. You know, don't add anything to it. Just pure Coca-Cola. And so be like, okay, I'm going to just fast that. Or I'd kind of maybe say I'm not going to do social media. And these are all, you know, I'm not saying these are bad things. But that's kind of what it, what it kind of looked like for, for me. But I was going to get challenged maybe more about a year and a half ago. It's like, there's more to this. There's got to be more to this than that. I felt like I'd kind of, for me, I'm just speaking, I'm just sharing my heart. That's what I was going to say uh, this morning. I felt like I'd kind of watered it down. And then a couple of stories kind of got me kind of thinking about it again. So this story is from Mark chapter 9. It's a story of a kind of child who was kind of demon-possessed. And it says, when Jesus saw a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit that was in this boy. And he says, you deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? Because they tried. You read the previous verses, they tried. He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. Well, I mean, that should just grip our mind. And it kind of gripped my mind. It's like prayer and fasting. As somebody, again, if you know my background, one of the things I was doing in the conference was just running various kind of prayer events with various nations. So I'm a great believer in prayer and the power of prayer. And yet he's saying here, not just prayer. It's like prayer is not enough in some weird way. It's prayer and fasting. It's like it's some way it kind of like supercharges prayer. And so that's beginning to bounce around in my mind. Like I said, I've got these things. I'm just sharing different things from my, my heart. And then another verse kind of uh, was drawn to my attention by a guy, again, a familiar passage by a guy called John Mark Homer. And again, if you've been around church for a while, you'd be familiar with it. And then it says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Well, I mean, that's an understatement, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And if you know the passage, there's some other... And uh, two of the temptations that Satan gives to Jesus. 
And I remember most of my life, I'd kind of come on this aspect of like, isn't the devil sneaky? You know, he waits till Jesus is fasted and Jesus is at his weakest to kind of come and tempt him. And then John Mark Comer pointed some gals, which I would say from people I begin to speak to him from my little bit of experience, is actually Jesus was at his strongest. He might have been at his physically the weakest, but he was at his probably his emotional and spiritual strength when he got tempted. It was like, this is the right moment. And so again, that began just to kind of drip feed into my mind. It's like, whoa, when you fast, Jesus fasted. Then he was at his strongest. I'm trying to become more like Jesus. I'm trying to grow and live in a life that reflects more what Jesus' life would look like if he was living Paul Phillips' life here on earth. And so that began, these were the things that began just to kind of work in my mind, some of these verses, some of these principles. Then a few other things just began just to kind of just challenge me related to this. Firstly, I don't know about you, but there's certain areas in my life I want to see breakthrough, one I want to see change. I've talked before about, uh, particularly just some of my children, just pressing into everything God has for them because they're not. And that breaks my heart. There's certain things in my life since I look at it, and I think, why do I keep doing those things? You know, I've done the kind of sozos, you know, I love the word, work that Claire and Mervyn do, but I seem to kind of keep bumping back at these things. I want to see change. Also, as a church, this is something that's very uh, close to my heart. I want to see more of him moving in power, both here on a Sunday and also out there on the streets. You know, I've seen different people get healed, but... You know, I've seen kind of legs grow, maybe an inch or two. I can show you some stories. I'm going to share them now. But I haven't seen a stump go all the way out. I don't know if you have. I've seen kind of people's eyesight, you know, it's not gray, and they can just see a little bit better. You know, you think, okay, go and see the optician. But I haven't seen a blind person see yet. And so these are some of the things that kind of kind of burn into my heart. I, again, also, it's great. We've seen, you know, person here, a person there, encounter Jesus and see their life transformed. But I want to see more. I kind of want to just be overwhelmed that when we have a staff meeting on Tuesday, it's like we've got a nice problem. Katie and I, my wife, we've just been reading um, Acts, if the story of the early church, and it says there this event called Pentecost when God's Spirit turned up 3,000 were added that, you know, that day. And Katie and I, maybe because we do some leadership stuff, we're going to go with the leadership mode and thinking, whoa, that's great. Man, that causes a problem. Uh, how are they going to do with this? wonder how they did this. I like to have those kind of problems, those issues. And I want to see more. And so that began to stay. It's like, I want to see more. I want to see more than I've seen so far. And that would naturally begin to drive me towards this kind of theme of prayer and fasting. The other thing that triggered this, a couple of years ago, my mum rang me up, and she says, uh, I feel like I'm getting too old. Somebody in the family needs to take up the responsibility for prayer and fasting for this family. She says, I've been fasting now, praying and fasting for the, like, the last 65 years on a Tuesday. One of you guys, as in me or the siblings, needs to take it up. I kind of looked at that and I thought, uh, in my family, I'm kind of seen as the vicar, <laughs> so for a better phrase. So I'm like, it's got to be me. Um, but it got me thinking, because I kind of look at my family, and we've kind of been through different things, and we actually all turned out reasonably okay, I think. I'm not asking for feedback on that one. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no thank you. No random emails. But, and I look at it and I think, God, it's got to be there. And I know my mum used to pray. I knew that bit. But I hadn't realized that fasting. And they got me thinking again. So these are some of the things. Like I said, it's going to maybe be a bit disjointed. But these are some of the things that are going through my mind. Also, as you know, some of you know, I mentioned it already at the beginning. If you didn't know, I work with Muslims. Most of my time is working with Muslims. Now, one thing that Muslims are good at, uh, apart from praying, because they pray five times a day, is fasting. And so kind of being in that kind of environment where they seem to grasp the power. I mean, they look at it from a different, slightly angle, but there's fasting there. I'm thinking, what does that mean for me? The other bit that we're looking at in this thing, which I will talk a little bit about, but not so much as fasting, is, is feasting. And again, that's something that's huge for them. 
you know, they have what's called the, the two biggest festivals. I'm going to give you a, a lesson on Islam. But the two biggest festivals in Islam, one's called the Greater Feast and the other one's called the Lesser Feast. And, uh, and so this idea of kind of seeing that, and, and suddenly my organization, uh, a few years ago, they kind of launched something where they're praying to see 10% of the Muslim population come to Jesus in 10 years. I mean, that's pretty big. You know, there's about 1.7, 1.8 billion Muslims. And so they began to pray and fast. And as part of that, they asked me to kind of just interview different people and their experiences of fasting. And then I began to speak to them. That began to kind of cause even more kind of verses and ideas kind of going through my mind. And so... Get a verse, actually. I read a... Oh, that was my journey. A very popular verse in Joel 2. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old man will dream visions. And your young man will see visions. Sorry, dream dreams. Your young man will see visions. Even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heaven on earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For Mount Zion and Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even amongst the survivors who the Lord has called. And um, the uh, guy who had interviewed, he actually had done 40 days of prayer and fasting. He kind of shared this. and then, I mean, there's great verses. I mean, I don't like you. I mean, Pour out his spirit. It's not like a little drop of his spirit, but this idea of just, when I think about pouring, you know, some of the downpours we've had uh, in the last few weeks, you know, when you get caught out in them, you know, you know about it. You're just dripping wet. Sons and daughters would prophesy, whoa, wouldn't it be great? We're kind of like, can you go and get your children afterwards? And you kind of go upstairs, and all you can hear is them just crying out word after word that they heard from God. Uh, I don't know now, I've got, I think of myself as middle, so I want dreams and I want visions. And, um, but whatever your category you want to put yourself in, dreams and, and visions. I will show wonders, you know, that we're kind of church that's saying, God, we want to see signs and wonders, and he's talking about wonders here. Even like what I just related to about, you just want to see more people encounter Jesus. Everyone, everyone, not some people occasionally, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Wow. Even if they do it kind of like accidentally, which is what happens sometimes in our society. And there will be deliverance. And I should have known, but I guess I've seen this verse. It gets quoted. It's actually used in what I just talked about in Acts before this story of Pentecost when God turned up. But he was the first person that kind of really challenged me about this. He goes, and afterwards, after what? Well, if you go back uh, in the chapter, even the verses before this, let alone chapter 1, the common theme that comes up is fasting. So just read the verses before it. Joel 2, 12 to 13. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garment. So this guy I was interviewing, he said to me, you know, do you want to see change? Do you want to be part of a historic change? For somebody like me, that kind of whets my appetite. And he said to me, you should start thinking about prayer and fasting. And so again, I throw this out as a challenge to myself and share my journey, but I throw it out as a church. Do you want to see the reality of this verse in our lives, in our church? The context of it is a verse that's quite, you know, it's loved, it's quoted every year around Pentecost time. Do we want that? I spoke to somebody else, and um, he again brought me, like I said, a, a, another piece of the puzzle, maybe, in a sense of jigsaw on my, my journey, but I'll throw it out for you. It's a story, and we find in James 5, and it's relating to this person called Elijah. We've got that well-known verse, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Well, Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, None fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crop. And so it's a kind of very familiar verse and it's often used in the context, you know, that we should pray and the power of prayer and that, you know, when you maybe feel kind of weak and you feel like you're not amazing, just remember Elijah and if you know his story, yes, he had these kind of amazing experiences, but he always had times when he's like, God, just take me away. I'm just, I'm nothing before you. 
Uh, and so we see that it was an ordinary man in relation to prayer. But actually, Elijah's part of a rare group who fasted 40 days. And he first pointed out that to me, that Elijah, as an ordinary person, was able to kind of like fast days. So all these things began to bounce around uh, in my head. You know, as I was interviewing these people, chatting to these people, looking at these verses, it began to challenge me where I am. And so I kind of share those verses. If, uh, and there was a famous uh, preacher called Spurgeon, and he described preaching as one blind beggar giving another, per- another blind beggar a piece of bread. So look at it a little bit like that this morning. I'm just passing some pieces of bread, some verses, some thoughts. And this is how it began to uh, affect me. I mean, like I said, I was aware of fasting. You know, I might just occasionally take a meal, but I kind of like pushed away from it. And again, I'm just sharing from my experience. I'm just sharing where I'm at. But the way I phrased it when I was talking about it with some friends, I always had a get out of jail card. Because I had such a high metabolic rate, so to give you some idea, when I was younger, uh, for some of you this might just annoy you, but let's just say that's my life, where I can, I can lose, I used to be able to lose kind of half a stone to three quarters of a stone quite easily in a day. Uh, on a Christmas day, I'd normally just put a stone on quite easily without particularly eating, and then I'd go for a run, and then I'd lose half a stone, and if I did a couple of runs, I'd just lose the weight. And so I could quite easily, if I didn't eat, you know, I'd get... I just get dizzy, you know, I'd faint. Even now, I still have that in the back of my head, so whenever I travel overseas, I always take a chocolate bar or two for each day, kind of just some nutritional thing, because I don't know when my next meal is going to come, and I'm going to begin to get uh, dizzy. So that was kind of like, for me, my kind of get-out-of-jail cards, like, you know, they'd say to me, um, not fast. But they, or the, one of the guys was interviewing me, he just challenged me, and he said, well, what, what, what's God said? He says, yeah, take notice of your doctrine and let it not be said. I'm not saying that. But he says, what does, your, what, does, um, what does we feel like God saying to me? Just begin to grow. So I just began just, you know, just begin to just stretch myself and, you know, just take a meal and not eat that. Uh, and I lived, obviously, because I'm here to tell the story. And then I just try, just begin to say, God, what is it? You know, what is it you want to, uh, I'm praying for, I want to see breakthrough, and I want, uh, as part of my response, I want to fast. One of the things I want to stress, which I forgot, that was early in my notes, is when it comes to fasting, fasting is not a thing to twist God's arm. It's not like, I've done this and you owe me this. The way I look at it, it's the same with prayer, I use this illustration. When I was a, a child, when I used to do physics, we were taught that lightning can strike anywhere, yeah? Kind of looking... Yeah, lightning can strike anywhere. But lightning is also more likely to strike certain places. Again, I do not recommend that you do this. But if you went onto a mountain uh, during a thunderstorm and you stuck a metal rod in the, um, up, you'd be more likely to get struck. Yeah? So we're told, don't, don't do it. <laughs> we can't afford being sued as a church, so don't do it. But lightning can strike anywhere, but it's more likely to strike certain places. God can move transform, bring change, bring some of these things I'm talking about whenever he wants. And he has done that often historically. But prayer and fasting is a bit like standing on a mountain in the thunderstorm with a metal rod up saying, God, strike here. And I don't know about you, that's what I wanted to see. You know, individually and as a church, let's stick a big thing up and say, God, we want you to move here. So I thought I'd best remind you that. So I just began just to try to just grow. Uh, and then just over a year ago, I felt like, because I didn't kind of jump into this, um, I felt like God wanted me to fast for a longer period of time. Um, so I spoke with Katie, and it's one of the things I will mention in a bit, just some of the practicalities of some of these things. And uh, we decided that I couldn't do a full fast, as in like not eat totally, because it felt like it would disrupt the kids um, too much. So we just decided that for 40 days, I would just eat one meal. And uh, I'm not standing up here saying I'm amazing, because I'll tell you what, just don't go without food for a day or two, and you soon realize your humanity. And, um, but it's probably just sharing it in a sense of just stretch, stretching us. And um, to be honest, the first few days were awful. Um, and then generally my body began to get 
uh, used to it. And I remember there's very specific things I was praying about. When we call people to pray individually and corporately, it's not just for, let's just do it for the fun of it. Tell you what, it's not the kind of thing you do for the fun of it. But it's like a particular thing that God's laid on your heart that you want to see um, breakthrough. And, um, and those particular areas I wanted to see change. I must admit to this day, I don't necessarily have seen any changes on those areas. But about day 30, I remember asking God, why do you have to wait so long? And um, it just began to reveal some stuff in my life. And then stuff that had gripped me, kind of habits that I had not been able to break um, in the sense of kind of how I use my eyes, it just broke. I can't explain it, but it no longer had a hold on my life. It was kind of like, whoa, that's weird. Uh, and like I said, I don't know why it, it took a period of time, but that was my experience. So out of that, I kind of came to Nigel and Joe, and I was like, we want to see. We've been talking a long time about wanting to see more. And we can talk about it. We can pray, and let's definitely pray and call the church to pray. But part of that is that we have got to begin to fast. It's there uh, in the Bible. And so we called this challenge to the leadership team. So you might not be aware of this, but we deliberately chose the speaker. So Claire spoke last week. I'm speaking this week. Mark is speaking uh, next week. And they're all part of a leadership team that we have in this church uh, with the Blundies and Nigel and Joe and Stephen Martin. So some of those are looking at themselves saying, thank you, I didn't have to do a talk on fasting. Uh, seeing Stephen at the back. But we deliberately... <laughs> We deliberately said we wanted to do this because if you look in the Bible, it was the leaders, Ezra, Nehemiah, Jehoshaphat, you could go on. The same in the New Testament, it was the leaders that called the church to fast. If you look, I think Claire mentioned it last week, that in certain denominations, to be a leader, you have to fast certain days, or you're encouraged to fast certain days. And so that's why you know, I deliberately chose them to do that talk because it's not something we just come in and say, hey, we're going to talk about this. It's something that we are seriously, as the leaders of this church, one of our responsibilities is to pray and fast for this church. And um, one of the things that we're giving you the opportunity to, and it's, we're, we're going to get more details in the coming week, is we're inviting you to join with us. Kind of like an invitation. You can look at it as an invitation to fast, yeah, but it's an invitation more than that to see more of what we want to see God do in our lives, in our church life, and in our communities. So just kind of coming into land, uh, I wanted to give some practical uh, bits just to finish, finish off before I hand over um, to Andy and Nigel. And um, firstly, like I say, it's not one of my main kind of flowing talks, but hopefully there's just bits there that you kind of, as I share them, maybe it was a verse, maybe it was a story that maybe you just kind of connect with. And it's like, God, what are you saying to me through this? But here's some kind of takeaways and practical bits. We fast and we feast as we want to be more like Jesus. One of the common themes, particularly the people I interviewed and even from my experiences, one of the main reasons we fast, and like I say, you don't just do it for the fun of it. It's like, what do we want to see happen? It's because of hunger. We want more of God. We want to be more intimate with God. That was kind of the common theme that I had as I interviewed people. Let us be more hungry for God. You know, we can sing songs, and I want to worship you, but it's like, I don't know about you, but I know that needs to go deeper in, in me. That desire to be closer to God. And it's nothing like physical hum hunger to stimulate spiritual hunger. One of the things is, one of the things I, I find at house me, if my stomach starts to rumble, and I feel like maybe Satan's like going, oh, you haven't eaten recently. I use that rumble as a way of going, God, I turn that into a prayer. Because I know I begin to think about food too quickly. And so I'm like, God, just increase my hunger. My stomach is rumbling and rumbling. God, increase my hunger for you. Increase my hunger. As a church, may we be more hungry for God. But it's like, God, we want more for you. It's like, I often describe it like, even without giving an invitation, people are kind of like yelling out, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to encounter more of God's spirit? You know, at the end of every meeting, if you're familiar with this church, we, we give an invitation for ministry. Historically and biblically, when just there's such great hunger that you don't even have to do that. So let's begin to do that. Secondly, start where you're at. 
be aware of your limitations. Again, Claire did a great job of just showing about this. You know, sometimes there's medical reasons. You know, maybe you've got diabetes. Uh, maybe just um, some aspect of history of eating disorders. You've got to be wise and be aware of these things. But at the same time, ask God what he is saying of you. And so for me, from what the doctor said, I didn't kind of just jump and do something. I gradually allowed God just to take me on a journey. But start. Start somewhere, wherever that might mean for you. Maybe it means don't eat chocolate or something. Maybe it means don't eat a meal. Maybe you've done that before. Maybe God's inviting you to a day. Begin to grow in it. You know, we talk a lot in this church about developing life-giving habits, having rhythms of life that bring tra- inward and outward transformation in your life. And we've done a whole load of them, kind of silence and solitude and prayer examine. And here's one that historically, let alone biblically, has got even more of a foundation, and that is fasting. Let the Spirit guide you. One of the things I have to remind myself when I feel like God's challenged me to pray, not just think, I'm fast. It's like, let's not just do this because this is what I did last time. Ask him what it is. How does he want you to fast? What's that going to look like? But to create a rhythm. In the same way, and again, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, is having a rhythm of kind of, you know, just celebrating not just kind of fasting, but, but feasting, because it's an area that, again, we're not very strong on, particularly the British. Well, at least my American friends have July the 4th and um, Thanksgiving. You know, if you look at Muslims, you look at Jews, if you read the Bible, just look at the Jewish history, they had some fantastic festivals. We want to grow in both of those. Secondly, just going to plan your fast. How long are you going to fast? What are you going to do in that space you create? Because people often say, I'm going to fast, and in that time, I, I, I'm going to just pray. Take it from, well, maybe it's just me. I just fill it with something else. I'm just going to lie, okay, I'm not going to go and join the rest of the people as they have their lunch. I'm just going to carry on working. Or you just sit there just thinking about your stomach. I'm just, I'm just being real honest. Think about what you're going to do that and try to help some stuff. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about in coming weeks is as we call our church to kind of pray and fast is we're going to just try to give you some resources to help you know what you could do in those times. Uh, you might want to talk to the people. Like I said, I talked with, uh, and I learned this from somebody else, I spoke to my, my to Katie and, and the family because I was aware that this was going to have implications on them. Katie finds it particularly hard for me fasting because I'm the main cook. And, uh, and so I still cook, but she feels bad for me. I'm like, I should be the one feeling bad for myself, but hey. Um, and so just talking those things through with your housemates, some of the implications of that, um, some of the practicalities in terms of planning, who's going to keep you accountable? You know, it's really easy to start fasting if God's called you to do something. Who's going to kind of keep you accountable? How are you going to start? So even when I used to fast with... Um, um, with the kind of Muslims when they fast at Ramadan, I learned very early on, caffeine's the thing that gets me. So that's one reason I still drink decaf tea now. Just began to get my body, detox myself. And even basic things, how to break a fast. Um, and so you don't want to just kind of have a thing, oh yeah, I've been fasting forever it is. Let's have a, a roast. It's not a good idea. Uh, you know, just kind of dried fruit, have a smoothie. Um, I actually used to have Coca-Cola. Um, cause it, <laughs> not because I'm addicted to it, but uh, medically, like, if you've got dehydration, it's not a bad thing for you. Kind of sugar, liquid, caffeine. Um, but however it is, <laughs> biblical foundations for c- drinking Coca-Cola. But wherever it is, have a plan. And so just to kind of just bring us back and then handing over. As a church, as a leadership um, we want to see more. And you can fill in the gaps. It might be individual people. You know, when I'm talking about um, some of my children, you could look at it on that level. It might be looking at communities, family members, healings, people coming to Jesus. Supernatural, as um, Nigel just mentioned this morning, it will show a bit more, just supernatural financial provision. All of that, I want to see more. And historically and biblically, it's not a formula, like I said, but there seems to be a thing that fasting 
attached with prayer draws the attention and the favor of God. And I, for one, want that. We, as a leadership, want that. And we, as a leadership, want to invite you individually and corporately. By corporately, it might be something you do individually. It might be something you do as a family. I had friends who just took turns to fast each day. It might be something you take up as a life group and you say, you know what, we want to pray and fast during this time. He wants to do Monday. He wants to do Tuesday. Who wants to do Wednesday? There will be a load of different ways of doing it. But begin to ask God as we begin to come up to this season because we want to fast to lead up to Christmas. And then at Christmas, we don't want to just celebrate just Christmas Day. We want to do the kind of traditional kind of feast. That doesn't mean gorge yourself, but kind of feast on who God is and what he's about for the 12 days of Christmas. So I'm going to pray. So I've gone well past my time and um, hand over.